Kitchen by Banana Yoshimoto. It's probably the closest thing you can do to giving yourself a nice warm hug because the characters are relatable, adorable, and it's something that I think a lot of people can see and relate to. The writing style in this is very lighthearted, approachable, uh, maybe even a little bit of honesty too. But why call this story Kitchen? My family and I were just recently out in Arizona visiting my parents. And it's one of those things that any parent out there with a six-year-old child knows that I'm hungry. When are we going to eat? And so inevitably that happens on this trip. And so I go into my mom's pantry and I open it up and that's when I see it. I, I see the cookie jar, the cookie jars from when I was a kid that since growing up through all the houses that we've lived in, there's this cookie jar that my mom would bake her own homemade cookies, put them in, and, and I just grew up that this was the flavor of cookies. This was the flavor of nurturing, of love. These cookie containers were almost like little magical containers, a portal through which you pull out a little bit of happiness in childhood. And it's interesting that here's my son, 35 years later, and I get to give to him the same experience, those cookies that 35 years ago when I was a kid would reach into and grab. And now I get to share that. In the opening pages to this, Mikage Sakurai, our main character, tells us that her anchor in life is the kitchen. It doesn't matter if it's dirty, if it's clean. If it's a kitchen, she's happy. And Mikage is so interesting because she even takes up this job as a culinary assistant, trying to almost just stay closer to that comfort, to that feeling. And that's not to say that Mikage is trying to withdraw from life, right? She's she's a character that just heads head first into life, trying to experience it. And through Yoshimoto's very informal writing, I think we get a very good feel for the type of person that it is. We all know that person that is just very open and willing to explore and, and, and just experience life. I think about what my life will be like one day when I get those jars, because that's something that I've requested from my parents, being 71, 74 years old. And Mikage has experienced a lot of loss in her life. She lost her parents when she was very young. Her grandparents raised us, and then she had to say goodbye to one grandparent and then the other. And in the wake of losing her grandmother, her last living female relative, she meets Yuichi, a boy that worked at her mother's flower shop. And now that she has kind of no place to live, she needs to move out, find her own self, he invites her to stay with them for a little while, where she meets Yuichi's transgender mother. And all of these characters are alone, emotionally, but not physically. And it's, it's, this is the center of the story, is these three characters, Yuichi Mikage and the transgender mother, Eriko. And this is where the heart of the novel explores love, nourishment, and caring. And how maybe certain things mean things to people, right? Like a sofa is literally just a couch. But maybe if you're someone that's always offering up your home for others and how people stay there, Sofas can mean so much more. It's an inviting place. It's a second home for someone to help someone get onto their feet again. And that's what these characters are almost kind of each exploring in their own way of what does it mean to get back on my feet? And that's just part of the appeal of this novel, I think, to so many people and why it's on so many lists of top reads to check out is because it's almost like being in a reverie yourself. You're transported instantly and cutting out anything that could possibly be cut out, and you're in the crux of the moment, not even the buildup, not even the aftermath, you're in the moment in this novel. And that allows you, the reader, to project your own standards, your own things that you need or maybe feel insecure about in life into it, and it makes it pull out a very personal reading, I think, when you read the story. And that's what I mean when I say Yoshimoto's writing is very honest. She doesn't pull those cheap shots or those lead-ups that try to pull off some big emotional turn. She puts you, the reader, in a situation that I know a lot of people can relate to. And it lets you see things that, wow, I didn't realize how important that cookie jar was to my life until I realized it, right? And that's what this kitchen is to this main character. It's that anchor, that thing that lets you feel comfort in this world. In the same way that the writing style kind of mimics that, right? Where it just anchors to a specific moment. And even at the end of a lot of sections, it makes a reference to how the kitchen fits in into the universe. It's very clear that Yoshimoto 
had a specific style and intent with how she wanted people to relate to this book. Which brings us to one of the main themes, which is grief and loss, like we were just mentioning. Yoshimoto's writing is a lot like some of my favorite author's techniques, where they'll take this happy moment in life and relate it to something that happened 20 years ago. And there's like a loss. And then there's something that happened six months ago. And there's a loss to yesterday, loss to today. And it's it's by smashing time across a character's life that we really get to see how the struggles of the past and the grief is something that we carry forward and how it impacts the present. The present isn't disconnected from the past and the past can't ever be gone if we're constantly living with it. But that's where the other theme and death are balanced with nurturing and love and how Eriko is a transgendered woman, very forward thinking for a 1998 novel. And the way that, it's not a comment on the political way that you'd think it was today, but it shows you how the love and nurturing that she can give her son is not defined by necessarily societal standards or even by the, the way that we'd think of it today. It's the way that Yuichi caring about our main character, Mikage, inviting her over, and Mikage trying to find herself and in turn sharing uh, caring about these two individuals that take her in, you see that even through grief and loss, that there's love and nurturing that we can give to each other. So that's something that I think a lot of people look for in their reads, is that idea of how to uplift each other and you know, how to face difficult parts in our lives. This is a book where three characters do it, and I won't give you any spoilers, but the ending just had me rolling. It's hysterical. It's a very fun read. I can see why it was all the rage when I was taking Japanese in college, why so many people recommended this book. I read this book with Christy Lewis, who's getting into Japanese literature. It's a very easy book to recommend to someone as one of their first reads to kind of get that style, that emotional connection, the, the jumping into the pure and honest way that we might react to a situation without the bells and whistles and tricks that writers do to try to make us feel more for characters. It just puts you in a room and have honest reactions with honest and realistic situations. So in terms of translations, like I said, this is an older book and it was translated in 1993 by Megan Backus. And I'll leave a quote to kind of summarize my thoughts on this from Katrina Dodson, a wonderful translator of Portuguese to English. But she said, another thing that's often said about translations is that you need them to be kind of renewed every several generations or so. And I wonder how true that is for this too. You know, this is, we're in a time where Women in Translation is getting a bigger spotlight. Christy and I read this as a part of Women in Translation Month. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us to look at what are some different ways that we resonate with books and how does the translation pay, play into effect with that. Because I think there's times where the translation, when I read that, I was like, oh, I wonder how that was phrased in the original Japanese because... There's a couple of parts here where I kind of wondered if that would be translated differently than it was back then. By no means do I mean that that would take someone away or totally out of the book, but as someone who has studied it, I was very interested in some of the decisions that were happening there. I googled it, and I'm not the only one that had that thought. I'll leave a link down below for someone who can probably articulate that a lot better than I can. But I will say that this is definitely still just an absolute fantastic masterpiece when it comes to Japanese literature that could only get better with time, I think. So there's some amazing things that happen in this book that I'd love to talk to you about, but I'm gonna keep this kind of spoiler-free and short. If you're looking for a coming of age story that is just comic, it's somber, it's a little bit of everything and just very to the point, five-star read, this is a great book for you to pick up. Have you read this book? Let me know in the comments down below what your thoughts on it were. My name has been Una, peace out.